sequels. No matter what medium one has, whether it be books, movies, or video games, once you have a formula that you think is successful, it always leaves the audience wanting for more. Sequels are difficult. They require an understanding of what made the original such a success to begin with. It's never just a character or a theme or the soundtrack. It's an amalgamation of all these factors which have to come together in just the right mix in order to become a success. For this video, we'll be looking at a game which hit just short of the mark of being called a good sequel. While its predecessor laid the groundwork for the survival horror genre in games, this one decided to take things in a bit of a different path. But did it change the formula so much that it alienated the player base, or was it just a reevaluation of the path that the original had thread a year prior? Let's find out with this retrospective. Hey there, kids. I'm the deadliest man in town. Today, as I was doing my dad things, such as telling people that Terminator 2 is the best sequel ever to hit the big screen, I started thinking about a game from my childhood, Alone in the Dark 2. Today, we'll be taking a look at the sequel of one of the most influential series of horror survival genre in games. We'll take a look at the development, the mechanics, and the story, and in the end, as usual, I'll give my opinion at the conclusion of the video. With Alone in the Dark, a continuation of the beloved first game was expected when it performed how it did, and Infogum didn't waste any time in ordering the team to start work on the second part. Coming off of the success of the first game, fans were excited to have another survival horror game in the style of the first one. However, the eventual end product would end up being a bit different than both the fans and the original creator envisioned. If you haven't seen my video on Alone in the Dark 1, I'd highly suggest you check the video out, as it'll give you most of the backstory regarding development of the first game, and why the development of the second game was with such a radically different team. Keep in mind that just like Alone in the Dark, the storyline of 2 is interwoven in the game by the use of books. In order to keep this retrospective to a somewhat maintainable level, I'll give a small synopsis near the end of the game. But honestly kids, most of the story will be explained in two cutscenes in the game itself. Of course, spoiler warning for both Alone in the Dark and Alone in the Dark 2. But before we even get to Alone in the Dark 2 kids, I feel I need to tell you about a game called Jack in the Dark. You see, coming off of the success of Part 1, Infogum wanted to build as much hype as possible for the second installment. In order to do this, a small demo, or more frankly a minigame, was created to give players a taste of what was to come from Part 2. This culminated into the development of Jack in the Dark, a small game distributed in 1993. We'll add this game into our review, even though plot-wise it doesn't hold a lot of relevance to the story of Alone in the Dark 2. In my opinion, this small game is mostly used to introduce Grace Saunders, who will be important in the story of Alone in the Dark 2 as she will star next to Edward Carnby, our protagonist from Part 1. Before we begin kids, a small disclaimer regarding the footage that I will be using for Alone in the Dark 2. Unfortunately, recording it on OBS through DOSBox was mostly impossible as it would just not record the footage. I have played the game, but unfortunately I will be using the footage from World of Long Plays so I can actually show you the game itself. To World of Long Plays, thank you so much for putting the footage online and recording it for posterity, as frankly, these games are getting a bit old. Again guys, thank you so much. The story of Jack in the Dark begins with eight-year-old Grace Saunders. Grace is in the big city on Halloween as she suddenly comes across a toy store. She opens the door and looks through the seemingly abandoned store before she realizes that the door has locked behind her. From here, it's time for us to search through the store and see if we can find our way out. The first thing we search through is the chest near the entrance of the store where we find a drum. We don't know how we'll use this yet, but let's put that in our inventory. After we make our way past the chest, we find a dime on the floor which we'll pick up as well. Behind the counter, we'll find an oil lamp on the floor near the cash register. 
If there's one observation that I can already make from this small tidbit of the game, it's that the backgrounds seem to have had a big overhaul in their bitmap quality. Granted, graphically it still doesn't hold much of a candle when you compare it to other games that came out around this time, like Star Fox and Doom, but it does seem like a lot of effort went into creating the background and atmosphere. After finding the lamp, we'll search underneath the counter where we find a book. Just as before, the books will give you some insight on the plot. The book, we find, is a collection of short stories by Alfred Kruger. Presumably, this is a spin on Freddy Krueger, keeping in line with the horror theme of the first game. Likewise, the production on the book is done by the Carpenter Company, a name that is most likely based off of director John Carpenter, who is known for his work on the original Halloween movie and Big Trouble in Little China. We'll use the dime we picked up at the vending machine near the jack-in-the-box on the counter. This will give us some candy. As soon as we do this though, the toys in the shop come alive and we'll be attacked by them. The toy to the right is our immediate danger. We'll use the lamp to cover the ground in oil, making it slip and fall so it can't hurt us. The rest of the toys still pose a threat to us though. However, having read the book, we learned that toys once marched to the beat of a drum. Well kids, we just so happened to pick up a drum in the beginning of the game, so this seems like a great time to use it. When we do, the toys start jumping into the treasure chest one by one, taking the danger out of the equation. From here, we'll move into the back room, where we find a vanity case and a mirror. When we move further into the same room, we see that someone has trapped Father Christmas itself and it is up to us to make sure that he escapes his entrapment. Santa is guarded by two dolls and we can't pass them as they're not affected by the drums. When we drop the vanity case on the floor, however, the dolls will be distracted and it will give us the chance to get behind them, allowing us to pick up a piece of candy. We head back to the toy store proper and give the candy to One-Eyed Jack, who will stop moving. Once done, we hold a mirror in front of him, which will scare him so much that he dies. We go back to Santa in order to get him out of prison, and we see that the jolly old man has already managed to escape by himself and has left us a present, thanking us for the help. We get out of the store in our costume that Santa left for us, and we wave goodbye to him before he speeds off with his reindeer. The game then concludes with a few screenshots from Alone in Dark 2, as thanks for playing through it itself. The game, in itself, is a fun little playthrough, which can be concluded in about 9 minutes total or so. I understand that players in those days were mostly excited about being able to get more information about Part 2 at the end, so they could see how things were coming along during development. All in all, it's not something I'd play again soon since the incentive to play is no longer there, but it's a fun harmless game in and of itself. After Jack in the Dark, it's time to look at Alone in the Dark 2 Kids. The story takes place in 1924, during Christmas, approximately three months after the end of the original game. Edward Carnby, now known as the Supernatural Private Eye, along with his partner Ted Stryker, are investigating the kidnapping of Grace Saunders, the little girl who we got to know in Jack in the Dark. After investigating the clues they gathered point towards a mansion in Hell's Kitchen, Ted apparently goes off on his own to save Grace. He makes his way into the mansion and finds her lying in a bed. However, Ted's attacked by a murderous clown from my nightmares and dies before he can become the hero of the story. The clown disappears in a puff of smoke and Grace is still in danger. A woman in a purple dress walks in. We can't see her face just yet, but judging by the way she saunters through the room, unfazed by the death of Ted, it's obvious she plays a bigger part in all of this. Edward, by this time, had received a telegram from Stryker to help him with trying to get Grace out from the clutches of whoever was holding her captive. Even though we'll be too late to save Ted, we can't let a young girl die. So as Carnby says, we take our trusty 38 and make our way towards the mansion. Two days later, we arrive at the mansion's gate. We make our way towards the entrance, but the gatekeeper apparently refused to let us in. Carnby for some reason leaves his bag at the entrance and then hightails it out of there. I guess maybe he'll look for another way to-
Jesus Christ. Okay, apparently Carnby, after having gone through the events of Dorsetto, is done with everyone's nonsense and decides to blow up the gate, giving him easy access to the mansion. We enter the grounds and find a guard on the ground. When he gets up, we notice that he has a Thompson. Luckily for us, his guns are no match for Carnby's fisticuffs, and we proceed to clap the ever-living hell out of this guard, leaving us with a gun and a flask. Obviously, after such badassery, we give Carnby his shot of alcohol to keep the demons in his head at bay and raise his hit points before we make our way towards the mansion itself. Carnby in this game is definitely more gung-ho than in the earlier iteration. Whereas in the previous game, you'd only have a few enemies that you'd actually have to fight, here, within the first two screens, we'll be fighting off multiple enemies who also have guns. The difficulty in these beginning stages is a definite step up from the first game, and even though we fight valiantly, within a few minutes of starting, the inevitable happens. Ah! Well, considering we don't want to get thrown off of a cliff again and end up like Ted, let's try this again. Instead of fighting off all the enemies and wasting precious ammo, we'll move the statue of the anchor that we saw while we were fighting the henchmen. We'll move past this and head into a maze, a creepy hand visible as someone is overlooking our unlawful entrance onto the territory. In the maze, we face yet another henchman. This one doesn't carry a machine gun, and after giving him a taste of good old Carnby's fists, he'll eventually go down as well. I'd like to note that one thing that Alone in the Dark 2 has improved upon is the controls. Before, controlling Carnby's running animation was a case of trial and error. You'd have to time your double taps precisely to get him to do the running animation, but in this game, it's fluid, and it actually works pretty well. After having finished off the foe, we'll pick up a photo. In it, we see a few figures standing near what looks to be an archway, one of them resembling the woman we saw when Ted was attacked. We don't know what this entails right now, but considering how the mechanics in the previous game worked, we're sure this is a hint for later. We move onwards through the maze, encountering more foes until we get to a diamond ace card on the ground. We pick up a rope, and delve into our ever-growing drinking habits once more before we continue on our way. Eventually, we'll find a book containing some lore. We can read it if we want, but I'll give the summary of the plot later on. We find a hook on the ground and pick it up. We'll also see a collection of cards on the ground. Considering we saw the diamond card on the ground earlier, we open it up and fall down the hole to find ourselves in a cave. There's more enemies to be found here, but they are disposed of fairly easily. When we push the chest out of the way, we'll find a metallic Jack of Diamonds card, which we'll take with us, and a little bit down the hall, we'll find a torn notebook. A pedestal rises from the ground in the background, and we see a ghost suddenly appear behind us. We use the metallic card and put it on the pedestal. At least we try to, as the placement for this particular action seems to be pretty precise. We finally get it and are notified that a trap door has opened. The ghost is still in our way, but Carnby has grown so powerful at this point that he can literally punch ghosts to the afterlife once again. Defeating the ghost awards us with the pirate sword. Considering how important swords were in the last game, it's safe to say that this will come in handy later. Now that we're safe in the caves, we can read the torn notebook. It's from our friend Ted, and he notifies us that he's most likely dead at this point. He warns us about someone called One-Eyed Jack, but unfortunately the notebook is too damaged to be able to read the full message. We eventually climb out of the cave system and find ourselves back in the maze. We're set upon by another henchman, but the Thompson makes short work of them. As we explore the maze further, it gets to be slightly repetitive. There's more enemies afoot, but Edward Killer Carnby manages to make short work out of all of them while periodically taking a break to down his recommended daily dose of alcohol. Eventually, we get to a spot in the maze where we're blocked by branches, 
Guns obviously have no use on the floral miscreants, but we'll use the pirate sword we picked up earlier and slash our way through them. Unfortunately, just like the cavalry saber in the last game, the sword breaks. As we move further, we come across the archway we found in the picture, along with an enemy called Shorty Leg. After we take down the shambling behemoth, we're left with a page of a newspaper which we'll pick up. Unfortunately, we're stuck at this point since the arch seems to be closed. However, if we take another look at the photo, we'll see that the arm up top is in a different position when the entrance is open. But how do we get up there to change the arm's position? Luckily kids, we don't have to. We combine the hook and the rope, and using our newfangled contraption to fling it around the arm of the statue, we pull it down to the position we saw in the photo. This opens up the passage and allows us to travel down into the depths, presumably underneath the manor. Unfortunately, we fall, and we roll onto an unsteady wooden bridge. To make matters worse, we lose all of our weapons, rendering us defenseless except for Carnby's Fists of Death. In this room, we'll find three items, namely a nickel, a crank, and a paper bag. When we get near the end of this room, we'll also see something near the edge of the narrow pathway. It's Stryker, and just as he stated in his notebook we found earlier, he truly is dead. Carnby swears his revenge at whoever did this, and besides this being a rescue operation for a small girl, this is now a personal quest for revenge. We push the body of Stryker to the side a little bit and find another torn notebook and a pipe cleaner, which we'll pick up. Now that we have both parts of the notebook, we can combine them and finally see the final message which Ted Stryker left to us. Carnby, if you read this, it means I am dead. The Saunders child was kidnapped by One-Eyed Jack, despite what the newspaper claimed. That man is a monster, obsessed with gambling and death. Hell's Kitchen is full of secret passages. I am sure that for one of them, the solution is in the cards. Remember our poker games. I can also tell you that the gang makes whiskey in the cellar and transports it by boat at high tide from a cave. After these small revelations, we head towards the door. Unfortunately, it's closed. But Carnby wouldn't be the world-renowned detective he is today if he didn't know a thing or two about breaking and entering. We use the newspaper page we found earlier along with a pipe cleaner. This allows us to push the key out of the lock and use the paper to drag the key back towards us and rewards us with both the key and the music man's pact, which will come in handy later. Using the key, we open the door and make our way inside to the whiskey storage area that Stryker mentioned in his notebook. We use the paper bag and pop it, scaring the henchman sleeping on the job. After this, we immediately push the lever and knock the henchman off the cliff, racking up Edward's body count even without the use of weapons. The henchman leaves us with a manuscript, a flask, and a riot gun, enabling both our self-defense and our drinking habits. As we head towards the clock in the room, Carmby notices that it has a hole in it. We use the crank, not to crank that soldier boy, but to crank the clock, moving a stack of boxes in the room and revealing a hidden passage, along with yet another book. Now that we're in the clear for now, it gives us the chance to read through The Music Man's Pact. By this pact signed by me, Sean O'Leary, called Music Man, and Elizabeth Jarrett, Arm of the Evil Powers, I am granted immortality. 
This pact is renewable every 100 years. In return, I swear fidelity and obedience to my masters. Should this document be destroyed in my presence, or if I come to die, the galleon will shelter me for two days. Signed off the coast of Haiti on the 25th of December in the year of 1724. We pick up the book and continue on our way. In the next room, we'll find cartridges for the riot gun and an open door for the elevator. We take the elevator upstairs and find ourselves facing yet another enemy. This is the infamous Music Man, which we read about in the Pact. As we know, he's immortal, so fighting him is probably not going to do us any good. However, the thing about Pacts is that they're not meant to be broken. So by using the Music Man's Pact, we tear up the document and break the spell which rendered him immortal, finishing off the enemy without us even having to land a single shot or punch. The Music Man's corpse leaves us with a hook, which we'll pick up. Then we'll make our way through the room, engaging in yet another round of daytime drinking before we head through the door into the next room. In this one, we'll find the battle door, and in the room close to it, we'll find two henchmen engaging in target practice. We finish one of them off using the riot gun, and the second enemy will finish off by beating him to death with the battle door. In the target practice room, we'll encounter another playing card puzzle. Considering we haven't seen any other card images so far, we'll change the images to the red diamond image once more. However, while doing this, we're interrupted by yet another enemy who wants a taste of the battle door. We take this interruption to explore the room next to the target practice room and discover a variety of items, such as a flask, a bottle of whiskey, and two lore books. We head back into the target practice room and find an enemy we missed. The enemy seems to be slightly intoxicated, so what better way to finish him off than by offering him a bottle of whiskey? The henchman drinks the liquor and dies suddenly of natural causes before we head to the side of the room where we'll pick up a sack. In this sack, we'll find the infamous Santa Claus suit, which we'll put on. This suit was featured frequently in advertisements for Alone in the Dark 2, and what better way to continue the game than to be dressed up as jolly old Saint Nick himself. We'll head back into the checkered room where we picked up the battle door, and this time head up the stairs near the entrance. We're finally in the mansion proper, where we'll encounter a tiny chef and a statue, which we'll approach to grab a crown off of it. When we are in the statue's line of sight, it will attempt to throw the trident at us. The trick to this is to make the statue fling the trident at us, but have the tiny chef take the hit. This will kill both the chef and the statue, enabling us to explore this hallway in peace. The next room we end up in is the kitchen. We pick up the frying pan from the countertop, along with a plate of fried eggs. No human soup this time, but there's a chef called T-Bone in there, who says that wine will open many a door. T-Bone's cryptic message apparently sends Carnby into a blind rage, as the next thing we do is knock the life out of T-Bone using the frying pan. T-Bone's death leaves us with a bottle of wine, and also in the kitchen we find a bottle of poison. We combine the two to make a poisoned wine before we leave the kitchen and place the poisoned wine in front of the closed door next to the kitchen. After a few seconds, we're set upon by henchmen, but only one of them is a threat since the others drank the poisoned wine. We finish the oncoming threat off with a riot gun and make our way back down to the room next to the target practice room with the mechanism on the wall. We'll put the nickel in there and receive two tokens. Now we can head back up. Inside the room the zombies came from when we put the poisoned wine down, we'll find a jukebox just past the entrance. We'll put the two tokens in there, which will make music play, and open a door further down the hallway. We'll head into the room and pick up the bulletproof vest. This will definitely come in handy considering how many gun-wielding henchmen we've fought off so far. And also in the room, we'll find a new Thompson and some bullets. We're finally back up to a bit of fighting strength before we fell down in the beginning. 
We'll head up the stairs in the room where we found the tiny chef and fight the zombie that we saw up the stairs earlier. We don't need a gun for this, as the battle door works just fine. After this, we head into the billiards room, where we find a derringer. The henchman across the table thinks he can take us on, but this little pistol packs quite the punch and we finish him off with the frying pan. The henchman leaves us with a sword stick and further in the room we find yet another book and a piece of parchment. We head out the room and head to the end of the hallway where we enter a bedroom. In here we find two ghostly hands with swords, who will attack us when we get close. Luckily, we just found ourselves a sword cane and we'll use this to finish off the bodiless hands. When they are vanquished, we find another parchment, which we can combine with the first one, which will give us a clue to an upcoming puzzle. In the bedroom, we'll find a bust on which we can place the crown we stole from the statue on the second floor. We find an amulet and pick it up, which causes Edward to float up to the fourth floor. We find a message on the floor which contains a bit more story. We continue on through the door in the room and encounter a nimble enemy. We try to fight him off with both guns and swords, but we need to keep mobile in order to keep out of his reach. Another enemy appears and we manage to fight both of them off using the mighty frying pan. The enemies drop a key, a flask, and a grenade, which we'll pick up. In one of the rooms, we'll find a jack-in-the-box and feed it a doubloon to get a red pom-pom. From here, we head to the room where Stryker climbed into from the beginning and find the murderous clam. Luckily, both him and the snakes that spawn into the room are distracted by the red pom-pom when we throw it. We climb down the chimney and encounter a large amount of enemies which we'll dispatch of with the Tommy gun. We take off the Santa outfit and grab the billiard ball from the tree before we head back up the stairs to the third floor and make our way towards the billiard room. We'll use the red billiard ball and put it in the machine next to the table, which will reveal a door which we can open with the gunman's key. We make our way over and open it with the key, bringing us face to face with One-Eyed Jack. Jack, in true Bond-style fashion, decides to tell us his origin story. By the horn of Beelzebub, the flying Dutchman was calling me. It was like honey to a bee. The enemy wanted to put an end to it. Its cannons spouted death. No matter. My ship was sinking, but my praise bridge flowed. Blood. On this Xmas Eve of 1724, the cries of pain filled the air like the most glorious of hymns. The captain, one Nichols, told me to go to the devil. He died cursing me. You will die by my sword, Jack! Ha <laughs> ha! His sword remained stuck on the deck of his ship, the Flying Dutchman. My lieutenants greedily burst the locks of the hold. The crew seemed disappointed with the loot. But I knew we had taken the finest of all treasures. And in Elizabeth's eyes, I could read our destiny, and death became an illusion. I signed the pact, and so did my men. The Dutchman was ours. From then on, thousands of legends were being told about the Flying Dutchman. We hid here in 1824, but the cliff collapsed on our ship. 
and so our land flowed with blood, and we named our conquest Hell's Kitchen. A land with no past offered itself to us to guarantee our future. We built our mansion, and since then, we reign undisputedly. <laughs> well, kids. Once again, we're dealing with undead pirates. Unfortunately for Jack, we've dealt with them before, and he's crazy to think that bars will hold Edward killing spree Carnby. We escape the jail with the hook and make our way out of there in order to find Grace. We head down the stairs to the third floor, but we're suddenly faced with Elizabeth, who uses her freaky powers to capture us. This leaves us playing as Grace, and this is a big departure from playing as Edward. We don't have any weapons, and the sections where we play as her are meant to be played stealthily. We head into the back of the car and find another red billiard ball. When the driver gets out, we sneak over to the yellow henchman to steal the hook that's lying down by their feet. We head to the left, encountering a weird tree and continue walking until we get to a pike in the ground where we use the red billiard ball. A statue comes out of the ground and we head back to the weird tree. We use the hook on the statue but are surprised by a henchman who comes out of the passage that opens, capturing Grace. From here, we return to playing as Carnby, who has been chained to a wall, with Elizabeth giving us her backstory. More than two centuries ago, Elizabeth Jarrett arrived in Haiti. I was then an innocent young girl. But Cotton, my tutor, taught me contempt. In hiding, a slave of his taught me to ride the shadows. Soon, the slave grew stronger than the master. Cotton felt the extent of my revenge, and became my creature. The soldiers took us prisoner, but could they recognize Cotton? From then on, the Flying Dutchman was my jail. I could see the desk where the captain hid the duplicate to the Iron's key. My Spirit wandered. One I Jack heard my call for help. My soul guided him. And death is my ally. <laughs> he and his crew would become immortal. And every one hundred years. An innocent girl would turn old for us. <laughs> A gust of freedom freshened my jail. <laughs> so quick summary time, kids, as Elizabeth has explained the plot for us. In the exchange for One-Eyed Jack and his crew's immortality, an innocent girl needs to be sacrificed every 100 years. Obviously, it's Grace's turn now. We take control of Grace again when Elizabeth leaves and slide a board to the side which brings us to a room with a parrot. We pick up a bag of seeds and feed them to the parrot who tells us that we need to head to One-Eyed Jack's cabin. We pick up a sandwich and a pepper pot from the room before we start heading through the structure we're captured in. We make our way up a set of ladders and encounter the crew on the deck partying. We are apparently on the Flying Dutchman, One-Eyed Jack's ship. We pick up a tinder box, taking care not to alert the crew before we head below decks again, ending up in a room where we find a small cannon and a crystal vase. We also find the captain's staff, which leads us to believe that this is Jack's bedroom. 
We put the small cannon in front of the door and throw the crystal vase against the wall, which alerts one of the henchmen. We load up the cannon with a pepper pot and light it when the henchman comes in. This, in turn, kills the unsuspecting halfwit, and he drops a bell when he does. We pick it up and make our way to the opposite room where we find a chicken's foot. We use the bell at the blue grate, which allows us to take the dumbwaiter up to the kitchen in the manor back where we killed T-Bone. We find a key on the floor and open the cupboard with it, allowing us to grab hold of an icebox and a pot of molasses. Now, we head through the mansion to get to the main hallway. A guard spots us as soon as we make our way there, so we drop the ice on the floor to make him trip and die, Grace trying to even up her body count with Carnby's. We'll head up to the stairs, to the third floor, where another guard will try to catch us. This time, we drop the jar of molasses on the floor, which will make the guard get stuck on the floor and unable to move any further. Now, we head back to One-Eyed Jack's bedroom, picking up the token in the billiard room on our way. In the bedroom, we use the captain's staff on the desk in the back, which gives us a key and a book with some more lore. We'll now head to the room where Carnby picked up the amulet and got transported to the fourth floor. We'll use the captain's staff on the slab, which will change it into the Loa staff, and transport us to the second floor. We'll head through the door on the right to the room with the jukebox and place our teddy bear near the large cabinet next to the open door, a little bit further in the room. We hide behind the jukebox and use the token from the billiard room, alerting the guard to something suspicious. As he makes his way towards the teddy bear, the bed from the cabinet comes down, brutally flattening the unsuspecting villain, and officially gaining Grace the status of serial killer. After we're done here, we head back to the kitchen and climb back into the dumbwaiter, heading back towards the ship where the cooks unfortunately catch us once again. Now, however, we take control of Carnby again and he is back with a vengeance, kids. He literally punches the flesh off of one of the henchmen and steals his sword before we kill another one. We go on a killing spree through the ship and find a short fuse and a flintlock pistol. We take a quick swig of alcohol again because we were running dry in those chains and run into the next room, picking up the quite useful key before we kill two more unsuspecting victims. Carnby grabs the poker from the fireplace and the pliers on the table before we head into another room and fight a big body pirate who drops a coat of mail and all sorts of items. We also grab a bottle and throw it, picking up the parchment that was inside which contains a bit of lore. Let's head out into the ship again. We fight another pirate with bad aim and pick up a flask and some pistol ammo. When comparing the amount of enemies you fight here in comparison to Alone in the Dark 1, you realize that you're definitely playing an action game instead of true survival horror. We open up another door and take a swig. We get to the storage room and fight yet another pirate that drops a powder keg and a book called The Opuscule, which contains more story. After reading it, we head up the ladder and open the door on the next floor, where we reach the sleeping quarters with a bunch of sleeping henchmen. We drop the powder keg here before we hightail it out of the room and into the next one where we find a pirate and a cannon. We kill the pirate and use the pliers on the cannon which makes us able to move it and turn the cannon. We fire the cannon by using the short fuse, igniting the powder keg in the next room and killing everyone in the sleeping quarters. <sighs> My god, Carmi. Anyway, we'll continue with some more binge drinking after that stunt and kill the small chefs that captured Grace before when we exited the dumbwaiter while we were playing as Grace. Inside the kitchen, we once again find someone who looks suspiciously a lot like T-Bone and fight him off where he drops a metallic jack of diamonds. Opposite the kitchen, we'll find a closed door which we can open with the jack of diamonds. Unfortunately, Elizabeth takes control of us once more and we're left with controlling Grace in this section. We head into the room where Elizabeth is, using the Loa staff on the statue to open it and use the chicken foot on the pedestal. For some reason, this summons lightning and completely decimates the evil sorceress, which in turn frees Carnby. Carnby wakes up 
and makes his way towards the ship's deck where we'll find the music man once again. We equip ourselves with the coat of mail and use the sword and pistol to kill the music man permanently this time, reducing him to nothing more but a bunch of bones. After this, we casually murder the rest of the crew until we eventually find Captain Nichols' sword and face off against One-Eyed Jack. The fight against Jack is similar to the pirate fight that we had in Dercetto, and eventually this pirate too will go down just like the rest of his brethren. Well then kids, this is it. We've saved Grace, allowing Carnby and Grace to escape in one of the lifeboats, and hereby ending our stint in Alone in the Dark 2. Although Alone in the Dark 1 left a big impression on me, I can't say the same for its sequel. The game felt different, and as I later found out during the research for this review, I now see why. De Girolami, who took over from Frédéric Reynal, definitely did not skimp on the passion in creating Alone in the Dark 2, but its greater emphasis on action instead of puzzle solving definitely made it feel as if it was trying to be something that it wasn't. Infogram knew they had success with the series at the time, but probably wanted the game to be more centered around action after seeing the enormous success of Doom. I wish I had more information to tell you about it, kids, but unfortunately, the development cycle of Dark 2 just isn't as documented as the first game was, leading me to having to make some assumptions based on the eventual product and knowing the state of the company at the time of development. The game isn't necessarily a worse game than its predecessor, but the increased action was just off-putting when compared to its more puzzle-based older sibling. It didn't catch the feeling of exploration and horror like its predecessor did, and I think this hurt the series a bit by trying to be something different from what made it so fun in the first place. Still, Alone in the Dark 2 was a game that I still enjoyed in my childhood regardless, and it didn't kill my love for the series at all when I played it all those years ago. Playing it now, I can definitely see the flaws better than before, but it definitely isn't a bad game in a sense. Keep in mind, this was a team under a massive time crunch, developing a game in under a year when most of the original development team had left. It must have been an enormous undertaking and having the courage to switch up the formula like they did was an enormous risk that I feel did still pay off somewhat in the end. The graphics have had a nice overhaul, especially the character models, and everything just looks a lot more polished than its predecessor. For now kids, just like the original Alone in the Dark, I'll uninstall Alone in the Dark 2. This one will be less likely for me to be installed again, as I feel this one will always remain better for me in my childhood memories. Maybe you agree with my opinion, maybe you don't. I'd love to know your thoughts on the matter, especially considering the new remake that was announced a short while ago. Are you excited? Are you worried the series might be taken in a direction it shouldn't? Let me know in the comments, because I'd love to talk to you all about it further. As for now kids, I'm going to be signing off because this recording room is hot as balls. If you'd like to support the channel, drop a like or subscribe if you want to. You don't have to, but I'd always like it if you did. As for now, I'll see you all next time when we cover Alone in the Dark 3. Take care, kids.